death, power, destruction, and rage. Sounds like I'm talking about a warlord. Kali, also representing the cosmic void and the divine mother, carrying all in her womb, this universe, her creation. Referred to as the feminine aspect of Kal, the masculine form of time, Kali refers to the destruction of time. She is shown as very dark. She is Brahman in its supreme unmanifest state. She will continue to exist even when the universe ends. No color applies to her. Good, bad, ugly, beautiful, none of the dualities touch her. And this is Kali. Welcome back guys. Thanks for watching my video. I'm Shubhrotham and I teach yoga. In this video, I'm going to be talking to you guys about Kali. Kali is a very special subject to people who worship her as the supreme goddess. She is worshipped as one of the prime goddesses of the ancient Akhori culture found in Varanasi. Moreover, she is quite popular in this day and age in what we have now come to know as New Age spirituality or what I would in a slightly derisive way term as hippie spirituality. But in this video, I just want to give you guys an idea of what Kali actually means to a yogic practitioner and also to people in India. First of all, I want to tell you guys that Kali or blackness or void also represents inertia or heaviness, inactivity. It represents the universe in its unmanifest state. So when I say unmanifest, I mean in a state of non-creation. Vishnu, who is said to be the preserver of the universe, was induced into this deep sleep by Kali herself. She is said to be the inducer of this deep tamasic sleep because she is the black one. And Vishnu, in her presence, goes into something called Yog Susupti or Ananta Susupti or the sleep of eternity. And when Brahma, the creator, wants to create this universe or start a new cycle, it's usually the gods and Vishnu who ask Kali to retract from this state of deep sleep, to get Vishnu out of this state of deep sleep by coming out of him. Now, there's a very special story with regards to this. In a classical scripture called Devi Mahatmayan, there are plenty of stories to show how Kali destroys the forces of evil. In one of the stories, there are two demons who threaten to destroy the universe. And in order to prevent this, Vishnu and Brahma ask the help of Durga. Kali is the more aggressive form of Durga. So let me tell you this to start off with. Durga is the more benign form of Kali or Shakti. All of these goddesses have descended from one primary goddess who is the wife of Shiva. Her name is Parvati. Now, Kali is born from the wrath of Durga. So when Vishnu and Brahma see these two demons ravaging the universe, Durga watches this as well and she gets very angry. And she gets so angry that her face becomes deep dark blue. Her eyebrows start to frown together and from this emanates the goddess Kali. Now typically, how Kali is symbolized is as a goddess with four arms. There is also another form of Kali and this is called Mahakali. Maha means great, and Kali means black. So the story goes that these two demons start ravaging the universe and Kali comes into being and she destroys them both. She is the personification of divine rage. Once she is awakened, nothing can stop her. And there are many legends and stories related to how this unstoppable force is first and second to none. In one story, she goes on this unstoppable rampage, you know, destroying all of these demons who are terrifying the citizens of the earth. But even after she's done with destroying the demons, she cannot stop because Kali, with those bloodshot eyes, with her tongue sticking out, 
her mouth wide open, her dark blue skin, her deep sunken eyes is in a state of intoxication. She's like a machine that once you get started, does not stop. She is in a trance, a trance of destruction. She is verily the goddess of destruction. She goes on to such a rampage that she starts dancing on the corpses of these dead demons. And in fact, she goes to the extent that she starts harming even the good people of planet Earth. So when Shiv, the husband of Kali, sees this, he starts getting worried and the gods ask him for help. So what does Shiv do? Shiv goes, places himself right in front of her and she's almost out of her senses. She doesn't know what she's doing. She's in this wild rampage of anger. He lies down and in that anger, she does not know what she's doing. She's just jumping around wildly and in that anger, in that wild madness, she stamps on Shiv. There is a special symbolic meaning to this. Those who follow the right hand path of worship in worshipping Shakti or the mother goddess are called the right handers or the right handed worshippers of Tantra. In this case, you're going to find that Kali has her right foot on top of Shiva's chest. The story goes that when Kali is in this wild rampage, she stamps on Shiv and she realizes after some time what she's done. And in that sheer embarrassment, it's what in Bengali we call lodjo or shame. In that sheer moment of shame, she sticks her tongue out and opens her mouth out wide, almost as if, what have I done? You know, um, this was the only way to stop Kali. And this is a very adorable way that Bengalis go on to describe how Kali has ended up with this tongue stuck out and with her mouth wide open. Of course, there is a more esoteric uh, turn to this. So if you look, if you carefully take a look at the pictures of Kali, you notice that she smiles with her teeth wide open. In some forms of Indian art, you find that this is the case and in other forms, it's not. Um, but in the more popular interpretations, she is seen with her tongue sticking out. It's absolutely red. Teeth are shining white. So if you have watched one of my videos on karma, I talk about the three gunas or the three properties of nature that people who study yoga or the yogic scriptures believe to be the primary things that move the universe or the primary properties that govern existence itself. These three properties are that of lightness, whiteness and goodness, which is represented by the color white. The second is the color red, which is of motion, passion, aggression, tenacity. The last is inertia, blackness, heaviness, absolute sloth, absolute stoic silence of mind. All of these three properties are assigned to Kali in iconographically describing her. The white shining teeth biting down on the tongue represents the triumph of Sattva Gun, the Guna of goodness over the Guna, the property of passion or aggression. The color black is what she is adorned with because she is the universe. She is the unmanifest. She is the inertia of what's not created. It's almost like the people who came up with this whole idea of Kali and who figured out the Gunas, it's almost like they were talking about dark matter. But anyhow, the symbolism is quite deep. It's quite esoteric in nature. And that's why I'm here in this video talking to you guys about the esoteric aspect of Kali. So, as I said before, it's the white teeth, the sattva guna that bites down on passion, uncontrolled passion and desire. This is one way of showing how yogis and tantric practitioners overcome the imperfections in their mind. The struggles of desire and the to and fro's, the, the maddening qualities of rajas or activity and passion that drives people crazy and into unrest and with no peace of mind. What I want to tell you, for those of you who don't know, is that sattva represents calmness and, and tranquility. It represents order and rest. 
It represents all those things that are good in life. A lot of people think that in representing Kali as black, that she is a dark goddess of destruction. Well, that's not entirely true. It's important to understand in totality what this symbology contains or what it's supposed to represent. She's the Divine Mother. She's the one who created the universe. She's the one who devours the universe itself. And that's why she's adorned with a garland of human skulls to signify or to indicate that she gives life, but she also takes it as well. She's got this fearsome form because in Tantra, the practitioners don't escape from the fearful and the darkest aspects of existence, which is which one of them being annihilation or, or death, but they don't want to make it seem dreadful. So what they do is through love and devotion, through calm and heightened states of yogic meditation, especially a tantric kind, they are able to come face to face with this very dark aspect of the universe represented as Kali. When they worship Kali with love and devotion, they in a way overcome death because death transforms from being an experience of absolute dread and horror into something that's blissful, tranquil and quite acceptable. The representation of Kali is very deep and as I said, it's quite philosophical in terms of how it ascribes certain meanings to what life is about, what these dualities of nature are and how by worshipping her you reconcile all of these dualities and become a true Advaitin or a practitioner of the non-dual form of meditation. So it's a very deep practice but I'm not going to make this topic too heavy as I just did. So I'm just going to talk to you guys about a few legends of Kali as well and how she became so popular. The most popular form of Kali and, and as her counterpart uh, as a sister goddess so to speak is called Chamundi. Now to Bengalis it's the goddess who slays a demon called Mahishasura. The demon in the north is represented as a buffalo and interestingly enough this buffalo also signifies or indicates the vehicle of the god of death Yam because the god of death rides a buffalo and Kali and Durga in slaying this buffalo represents how the practitioner by worshipping Kali slays this god of illusion, this god of death because the very vehicle that moves, this very vehicle that carries the energy of death is slain. When the vehicle is slain, there is no vessel to be carried in. So in other words, when this idea of death is slain within the mind of the practitioner, the idea of death is subsequently slain as well or destroyed. Mahishasur also represents arrogance and absolute violence of mind. Mahishasur ravages planet earth and he's a proper demon. He has all the powers that you can get from penance and austerities. The gods obviously don't like what's going on. And Shiva and Parvati, the god and goddesses of all gods and the god and goddess of creation, think of what to do. But there is not enough of stimulus. One thing I have to tell you guys is that Hindu scriptures are written in the form of poems. So it's inadequate for me to just talk to you about this as a story. If you read it as it was as a poem, it's, it's rather beautiful. Vishnu comes and the god of the gods, Indra, asks Parvati and Shiv to help them out. And when Parvati sees what Indra is showing, what this, god, what this demon is doing, she gets so angry, she gets so angry that from her forehead there comes out this ray of light, this powerful ray of light. And at the same time, the gods themselves are seeing what Mahishasur is doing and they start recollecting how this demon embarrassed them, how this demon humiliated them and made them feel like inferiors. And from this combined rage, all at once came out this goddess called Durga. This goddess Durga was the one who eventually slayed this demon called Mahishasur. In the south, there are these two demon brothers called Chanda and Munda. 
in the same way that Mahishasur was ravaging planet Earth, in the same way Chanda and Munda were ravaging planet Earth. And Kali, as Chamundi, came down and destroyed these two demons. There's a more interesting story. All of these stories are in this ancient Hindu scripture called Devi Mahatmayan. Okay, it's a, it's a kind of a, a scripture, a, an ancient Hindu scripture. In the same chapter, she slays a demon called Rakta Bij. Rakta means blood and Bij means seed. So the goddess starts destroying this demon. The problem is in destroying this demon by cutting his head off, every drop of blood that flowed from his slain head, every drop of blood that fell on the ground created thousands of other demons just like him thousands of copies of Rakta Bij. And so what happened was that this became a huge problem. So instead of chopping the head off of this demon, Chamundi, right, took the form of Kali and started cutting the head off. And instead of letting the blood drop onto the ground, she started drinking the blood so that the demon could not replicate or the demon could not multiply. If you really think about this esoterically, drinking the blood has a special meaning. What's usually believed is that the whole field of this whole battlefield, this whole war that goes on in this very moralistic sense, if you want to put it in a certain way, happens within the mind. So the mind contains the demons and the mind contains the gods. So the gods and the demons are continuously fighting. You're always fighting with yourself, trying to make the right decision against the wrong decision. And that's precisely what this Hindu scripture talks about in, you know, describing the story of the great goddess. Your mind is the creator. Your mind contains all that's good and all that's bad. And your mind contains all of those energies that can pull down the various powers of these gods from various dimensions. So when you pull down the power of this goddess Kali, you're going to encounter certain characteristics of your mind that embodies the same features and characteristics that were represented by these demons that she slayed. So it's very interesting when you think about it this way. When people worship Kali, you only see the rituals, you only see the formalities, the giving of the sweets, the, the chants, the mantras. But what I feel, and in my opinion, is that every yogic practitioner and every person who worships Kali has a different way of looking at it. Every time you chant a mantra, every time you perform an incantation, you raise certain energies up. So in raising these demonic, I, I wouldn't say energies, but these demonic aspects of your mind and in raising the goddess aspect of your mind, you're eventually purifying your mind in a certain sense while chanting this powerful Kali Mantra or while worshipping Kali herself. A lot of people don't understand what it means to worship Kali. It's a very delicate and it's a very serious affair because those who successfully worship Kali are set to overcome death itself. She represents death. And when you visualize her as death, when she no longer troubles you in that fearsome form, when she herself becomes the one who blesses you, who has you in her favor, death has no power over you. And this takes years of practice. So it's a very special practice, uh, this whole worshipping of Kali. Interestingly enough, if you look at the various legends that are contained in Hindu scriptures, Shiv, this great god of, he, he's, he's got this matted hair, you know, he wears leopard skin, he's wild, he's uncontrollable. He represents all these sort of antisocial aspects of, you know, a man or, or of human beings in general. And it's usually Parvati who has this calming influence over him, or it's usually Parvati who calms him down and tranquilizes him, or you know, gets him to consider changing his ways. Interestingly enough, the same role that Parvati plays in this sense is played by Shiv when he's trying to calm down Kali. As I earlier mentioned, when Kali was unstoppable and just continued destroying everything when there was nothing left to destroy, 
Shiv became the Parvati of the situation and tried to pacify her. In other words, it shows how Kali, Shiv and Parvati are all one. It shows how the dualities of nature, good and bad, light and darkness, when you properly understand what it means to worship Kali, all of these dualities are brought into one singular essence and that's when you understand what lies behind all of manifestation. What is that thing that is unmanifest? What is that that you cannot see with plain open eyes? And this is the whole significance of worshipping Kali because she is the unparalleled, second to none, divine mother for all those who worship Shakti, for all those who practice Tantra. Of course, there are there is the left-hand path and there is the, the right-hand path, but I'm not going to get into that just yet. When you reach the third eye, for example, you find that the god of the third eye is what you call Ardhanarishvara or half man and half woman. That's precisely what happens in worshipping Kali because Kali is Shiv and Kali is Parvati at the same time. Kali is Shakti herself and without Shakti, Shiv, who represents Purush or so, so to speak, the divine flame of the spirit cannot really manifest himself. He needs Shakti, he needs power. So you find that in the north of India, or you find that people who worship Shakti are more inclined towards the feminine aspect of, you know, what we consider to be something that is to be worshipped. It's, it's more of mother worship. I wouldn't go to the extent of equating mother worship and worshipping darkness as something particularly devious or diabolical, but it's, it's, it's quite esoteric and it's not easy to comprehend as easily as by just simply thinking of worshipping darkness as, wow, we're worshipping darkness, how cool. It's so cool to be all dark and gothic. That's, that's just not what worshipping Kali is about, nor just plainly chanting the mantras is something that's highly recommendable. It's, it can be quite what, what we would say as uh, periculous. When you look at Kali properly with the four arms, you see that in on the left side she holds a sword, uh, what's, what's more commonly called in India, you know, the sickle, a farmer's sickle, but it's sort of like a sickle-shaped sword like a half moon. And below that there's a severed head. On the right side she's got this gesture which is a gesture of be blessed, do not fear. And she's also got a garland of human skulls. When, you, when you're talking about the left side, okay, you're talking about the more fearful aspect of Kali, what the left-handed tantric practitioners tend to worship, which is the more fearful form of this dark goddess. The sword and the slain head represents cutting off the ego because the ego is a thinking principle that originates from the head. It's a thought form. Arrogance, ego, pride, all of these things come from the head region. And so symbolically, the severed head represents severing of arrogance, even ignorance, pride, and all that's considered to be low. And that's how Kali's left side is, is symbolized. But at the same time, since it's so difficult for the practitioner to get rid of all these bad qualities, what Kali does as a boon, as a reward, is she blesses the practitioner and she says, do not fear. That's another aspect of this right side of Kali. So there's a very deep significance in terms of the iconography when you, when you study uh, the iconography represented as Kali. I already explained to you what the hanging tongue means, uh, but basically in India there are many inter interpretations as to how Kali, you know, came about with this tongue hanging out with the, the shining white teeth or the black color. There are various interpretations as to why the left foot is on top of Shiva's chest rather than the right foot. The more common interpretation and the more common version is that when the left foot is on top of Shiva's chest, it's because it represents the left-hand path of worshipping Kali. And 
when it's the right foot, it's the right hand path of worshipping Kali. But nevertheless, when it comes to this particular story of pacifying Kali, it's always Shiva who has to pacify Kali. So Kali is a very interesting historical subject because back then there was a war of cults. Uh, those who were worshipping Shiva as opposed to those who were worshipping Durga or Kali. The feminine worshippers and the masculine worshippers. So there's a whole lot of history going on over here. And it's not as simple as, well, Kali has her tongue out and it's black color because it's so and so. There's a, there's a lot of uh, story behind this. I'm going to end this video by putting in a nutshell what it essentially means to Kali and what is the object of her worship. She represents the terrible aspects of the universe, the raw cosmic potential, the things that makes volcanoes erupt, that causes supernova explosions, the dark matter in this universe. She is the material aspect of, you know, creation. She is what Hindus consider to be Brahmin herself. Now, this is such a gigantic thing to envision. It's such an overwhelming thing to come to terms with. So when you worship Kali, you tend to tone down on these terrible aspects and within your own mind, which is generally filled with dualities and instability, you're able to bring a certain level of stability and consciousness. You become more and more calm as you worship Kali. Rather than seeing her as a terrible goddess of destruction, you more and more start to see her as a benign goddess. You no longer see the universe as something horrible or as something irreconcilable. You see that in worshipping Kali, you're able to reconcile why there is good and why there is bad, why people are the way they are, or why the universe is the way it is. What is life and death? All of these things come to light and all of these things illuminate the practitioner as he or she goes on to worship Kali, day by day, month after month, year after year. It's a very special worship and it's more favorable to those who want to practice the more unconventional aspects of, of religion and yoga. When you worship Kali, as Ramakrishna did, Vivekananda's guru, you're basically asking of yourself a certain amount of strength, a certain amount of courage in facing the ultimate reality and the ultimate truth about this universe. And in overcoming the terrible aspects of this universe, you're able to live life more fulfillingly, with a lot more freedom, with less fear. And this is, this is the most special and the most unique part of worshipping Kali. So if you worship Kali because you think it's cool, or maybe because you want to smoke some dope, that's all right, you can go ahead and do that, I guess, because the Aghoris do it for the same reason as well. But they do it away from society. They do it away from the comforts of society. They worship the most terrible aspect of her. And in overcoming that, they are able to overcome death itself. This is what it means to worship Kali, in a nutshell. And that's it for me in this video. Like and subscribe to this channel, and I'll join you in next week. Bye-bye.